Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. No matter where you are on this fine planet of ours, we are tickled pink that you chose to spend your time with us. We're going to have a fun show today, folks. We have got an amazing speaker. You're going to meet Dr. Jackie Gerstein shortly. She goes by the name Jackie, though. She's very informal. She's a lot of fun. And she's going to take you through just an amazing crash course of slides. It's going to be fast paced. You're going to be made to do homework. Don't blame me. Blame her. It's going to be fun. If you're wondering who I am, I'm Daryl Prail. I'm your host, and I am just delighted to spend this quality time with you. Let me tell you a little bit of how the show works. It's pretty straightforward. There, it's, it's interactive, as interactive as we can make it. And to do that, there's two ways to do it. I'm going to show you the kind of the, the standby, it'll always work way. And then I'm going to show you the way we're going to push you today, if possible. And that is you can use the control panel. In the control panel, uh, you'll see it probably in your upper right-hand corner. You have a section called questions. Any questions or comments you have in related to the show that you want Jackie to see, put them in there. We'll get them. She'll get them. And when we can, we'll answer them. But we're really pushing you, ideally, to use Twitter. And the reason we want you to use Twitter is because then you get to see everybody's comments, not just your own. So it's very interactive, very social. And to do that, we encourage you to get your favorite Twitter client going right now. We're going to use the uh, phrase hashtag IDML13. And throughout the presentation, every couple slides, you're going to see this footer at the bottom of your screen that reminds you of what that hashtag is in case you forget. So that's the important thing. That's what you need to know. Twitter is number one, but we are following you on the control panel. Because it's so fast paced, what I want to do is I want to introduce you to Jackie, all right? So let me just quote something here for you. I don't do teaching for a living. I live teaching as my doing. And technology has increased my passion for doing so. That's Jackie, folks. She's taught face-to-face -face and online for several decades. Currently, she teaches master's level online courses in educational technology for Boise State University, Walden University, and Western's Governors Universities. She believes that an important role and responsibility of the 21st century educator is to share resources, ideas, and instructional strategies with others, and that's what we're doing today. As such, she tweets at Jackie Gerstein, all right? And she blogs, and we're going to have all this information for you at the end of the show so you can get a hold of her. Um, everybody always asks, can I get a copy of the slides? Is this being recorded? And the answer is just an overwhelming yes. It's being recorded. Yes, you can get a copy of the slides. And in fact, Jackie's already put them online on Twitter. So one more reason to go to hash IDML13. With that, what we're going to do is I'm going to give control of this presentation over to, uh, to Jackie. And while she takes that, I'm going to sit here and just kind of relax and monitor Twitter and tell you what's going on and enjoy the show. Jackie? We need you to share your screen and take control. Hi, Daryl. Thanks for um, setting this up. Daryl's a good guy. He's been really helping me, so I appreciate him and Robin. You guys have rocked it, so thanks. And I'm happy everybody's here today. All right, so I'm going to throw a lot at you today and have you interact in different parts, as Daryl said. And that's the way I, I'm type A. I'm from the East Coast, so I like to give people who participate with me, whether it be in a class for once, an hour, or day-long workshops, a lot of things to think about. So hopefully you'll leave with some ideas, some, some ways to really think about mobile learning pedagogies because we're really living in a very cold time, and you'll hear me say that on various, at various points today. And again, there will also be some interactive parts that we get to hear your ideas because I believe good education is two-way interactions. So Daryl already told you a little bit about me and that's the slide that says that shows it. So those of you who um, when you have the when you have the slide deck itself from SlideShare which I uploaded into the um, uh, it's going to be on uh, sorry, on Twitter and in SlideShare, I actually created a little game that you could play to learn about these principles of what I call epic, epic learning. And if you have that other slide deck open and want to play it, you're more than welcome to go play this game because I'm going to talk about these principles and my belief is we learn by doing and maybe you, that's better for you in a way to learn and I'm giving you the option to look over these principles via this learning game I created if, if you 
if you choose to do so. So the first part is, you know, when I look at this idea of pedagogies, and you'll hear me later. We lost you there. Uh, I yeah, sat on my button. Back. I'm back on. I heard I'll like, do it every so. time. <laughs> don't sit on there your you go, buttons. Folks, you know we're live. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't ever sit on your button when you're live, or at least know where it is so you could turn it back on. Um, this idea of what epic learning is, if we want to really look at what makes good pedagogy, andragogy, hedragogy, which I'm going to talk about soon, I think we have to examine is what is good learning and this idea of what is epic learning. And there's some principles, these are just my thoughts of being an educator and really exploring how people learn and what makes powerful learning experiences for a good part of it, my adult life. And some of the principles and by the, are, by the way, I have probably about six of them and each of the principles have a link at the bottom, again when you get the slideshow from slideshow you'll be able to connect to those to articles that actually reinforce the principle and the first one I believe in and oh by the way that these pictures you're going to see these photos were taken in my I taught an undergrad class for with vocational students on interpersonal relations and we use extensive use of mobile devices so I draw a lot on I did it for several semesters and it the it was even more powerful than I ever expected having device, mobile device use. So again, as you look through these slides, note that they are my students. So the first one is education should be learned by doing. And those of you who follow um, futurists know this gentleman named Ray Kurzweil, and he talks about singularity. And he's not even an educator, but he all, he believes that humans learn by doing. Second principle I go by is learning should be engaging, authentic, and relevant. And and those of you who some of you already did this Flickr act activity and we're going to try it and I'm going to show it to you in a, in a couple minutes but this idea especially now that there should be no reason that learning should be shouldn't be authentic and relevant and again there's a link at the bottom for you to check out learning should produce a state of flow Check, oh, some of you know how to say his name. Someone told me how to say it, and I think several of you know what, what I'm talking about. Ch Mikhail Czech is, but I'm not going to destroy the poor man's name, but he studied, I saw him speak once in person, brilliant research of this idea of state of flow. And if we think about what makes good learning experiences for ourselves, nothing, nothing, it, it's, a, it's amazing times when we're just so engaged, like when I put together these PowerPoints, I get into a state of flow, love putting together the images, finding content, it's when nothing else exists in the world and time just seems to, to dissipate. And learning should be holistic, engaging intellect, emotional, social connection, and whenever possible, the body. And I talk about a lot of times as our education system has been designed, sadly, to teach us from the ears up. And what I mean by that, if you think about your learning experiences, K-12, college, we tended to get a lot of information, especially as we got older out of elementary school, hearing in the brain. And it's it from there down, it's not engaged in our formal learning experiences, which which is a shame. Again, this was a picture taken from one of my classes. And it should be include critical reflective thinking. And those of you who look at um, those those of you who um, know David Schoen's work, the reflective practitioner, it's pretty f powerful. Stephen Brooks for higher ed, and. I wrote a blog post that got a lot of hits called Where is Reflection in the Learning Process? I think we don't give learners time and opportunity as well as ourselves to really think deeply about our learning experiences. And finally, this one that learning should change behavior and thinking. If you know Grant Wiggins, he does understanding by design work and he talks about, he this blog post was really incredible. I, I highly recommend to read later on. He talked about we've gotten away, we, we think curriculum is about knowledge dissemination and it really isn't. It's this idea of good curriculum and good learning should change behavior and our thinking. So as I started off this, this session today, I, I have failed you. If you spend an hour with me today, I don't want this hour to be a waste of your time. If you don't leave today wanting to try something with your students, try a different type of mobile activity, explore more the concepts that I'm covering today than I failed you, even with this hour. 
So this is really powerful for me. Anytime I meet with a group, like I said, it might be for a day, it might be, even when I had, we, I teach online now, but when I did face-to-face -face classes, each time a group of students met with me, I wanted them to leave thinking, wanting to try something new. We're, we're, learners are giving us their time, and we should give them something in return. So this idea of learning should be filled with epic wins. I love that term. It's, it's from gaming. And a lot of you, since you're in a mobile course, I'm sure several of you are game, gamers, that getting to the next level of Angry Birds, or I'm playing Candy Crush now. That's a, pretty, that's a new one on my list. I don't know if you've tried Candy Crush. But, but being able to get a higher score than I did before, and this was actually in my class. They were playing a game that another student invented, and they won. And that was them showing their little dance of winning. So I want all learning to be filled with epic wins. So what I did, and um, Del and Robin sent you out um, this idea, and I wanted to also bring in uh, some mobile activities you can actually do with your students. I love using the Flickr page. And what I do is you set up a Flickr page, an account, and then you could get a mobile dummy email address. Excuse me. I'll turn it off while I cough for a second. Maybe not. <coughs> Sorry about that. And so I wanted you to see this, but I've had everything students take evidence of values, of they did their emotional intelligence. I, I've I've heard teachers saying, telling students, go take pictures, evidence of architecture. I'm taking a pottery class, and he set it up after I told him about it so students could take photos and upload them to um, our, our, the group page of different architecture in town that could be used for pottery. And what's really cool is, Flickr generates this dummy email, and by dummy email I mean uh, you could you could once you set up your Flickr page, it generates an email for you. So it's not connected. Students don't know your private account. And what's really cool is it could be uploaded on from any type of phone, from a website, um, and the students don't have to have an email or an account with 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 Flickr. So if you haven't done so and want to grab that, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. That's why I sent it ahead of time um, in the email. But if you want to, you can upload a picture to our group page. And this is the email. And I'm going to go to it for a second and, and, and see what's oh, I'm clicking the wrong thing there. And see what it looks like now. So what's really nice is you could do it in real time. And this is people from the class who who already uploaded some pictures. And you could actually click into the um, you could click into that web address too. Actually, I'm gonna throw it in Twitter in case any of you wanna have a look at it. I'm gonna sometimes you'll see me flipping around. So what's nice then is you could also um, share the link, share the URL with students and they could have a look at it. But I often try to do mobile learning activities that that students don't have to log into or create an account. And if they do, I want to keep them private. So we just got learning from peers at vet school. So these were all people from different topics I gained as being part of a language learner, teacher, and researcher. This was funny. I actually read this earlier. An online course by an instructor living on an island who has a llama in her backyard. Students from around the world. None got to see the llama, but we really bonded and had a great time with learning. There's some more hands-on hands -on science. This was pretty cool. All about manipulation of cardboard paint and duct tape. So for me, again, look at some of these. Even the visuals are pretty powerful when we look at this idea of epic learning. So the rest of the session, I'm going to be talking about the pedagogy, andragogy, heterogogy of mobile of learning in general, but mobile learning and how we could really start thinking about how can we could construct experiences that really honor that. I was, I was refreshing. Sometimes it takes a refreshing. Um, 
I don't, someone asked about Bloom's learning theory. I use it as a guideline, but I let come back to this, whoever asked that, and um, see where it might fit in. I, I'll ask you at the end. As I go through these theories in the next several slides, you tell me where you see it, where it might fit, be fitting in. What I've done, <coughs> well, actually, let me go through this next section. Okay. So with some of the, the guiding principles I think about when we look at mobile learning is looking at use patterns already. So there's a lot of research right now on, um, on how and what folks are using on their mobile devices. And for me, the rationale then becomes how can we, how can we use what students are already using one, it'll make our jobs easier because we're not teaching them new technology. And two, I want my learners to, to use their devices for learning in the outside world. This isn't part of the slides, but if you look at some of the use patterns of adolescents and search patterns, they're pretty tech savvy and texting and things like that. But in terms of learning, they're, they, don't, they could use some help. So I want them to be able to use their devices once, once they want to look for all my learners, once they want information in the real world, I want to teach them learning strategies and build what they already know. So as you look through this, think about, if you're, especially if you're going to bring your own device, which I, that's what I did and I like the idea of bring your device, own device because again they could then take it to the outside world. If we're having students use iPads or netbooks in the classroom and they don't have one at home, then they're not going to transfer that learning into their, the rest of their lives. And for me that's really important. And I work with the students I've worked with in the past aren't, aren't um, high income students and very few had smartphones. And if you see the data on the next few slides, this is really recent data, 2013. Adult gadget use has gone up tremendously. But on the next slide you'll see it's in t cell phone we have such huge percentages of all ages owning cell phones right now, but not smartphones. All right, so if we look at the same thing that um, our teen use, they a lot have cell phones, but again, smartphones. So if we're looking again to implementing mobile learning into our classrooms, are we going to have ha app heavy type of assignments where students aren't going to have those app accessible outside of school. So again, if you look at demographics, you're also going to see a difference in, um, and again, I've worked with low income. So I mentioned this, but I'll repeat it. This idea is based on Pew Research and other. If we're going to do a BYOD program in our classrooms, we shouldn't requ require heavy use of apps. And I did it, and I'm going to share in a little bit some of the learning activities I did. And I, it was a rich array. I developed a lot of learning activities and had no need for apps. So let's look at the next few slides. And as we look at them, think about how typical use patterns of what, what kids and adults are, are doing already with their, with their cell phones. And think about one activity you might be able to do in your classroom because because of the, what kids what folks are already doing, we know that texting is huge. So again, when you're thinking about designing mobile learning activities, what can you do that relies on texting? And you could actually integrate that into your learning activities. Some more information on texting, and then what they did, what type of activities did they? do when they were got on their cell phones and when they got on the internet. I think this information is really rich in informing us. Again another slide. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna share specifically. You can look at the research, but I think again I find it fascinating what folks are doing and how I can integrate that and enrich my learning activities as an instructor. This is a new one. I really like this. A self-expression. And we also know that if we're going to be um, digitally sensitive, if we, we're going to know, 
I like again to make sure that what I'm designing can cross countries, can co cross demographics, can go across socioeconomic levels. I want my the learning activities I do with my students in my classroom to be able to be used almost anywhere. And we know that mobile use in Africa is huge now. And that that's how in a developed world that's how people are getting online. And I'm going to refer to these few this research study and I encourage you to look at it some more. It was done by Educause. And it was in 2011 and you can see at the bottom 3,000 students from over 1,100 colleges. And I'm going to share some of the results in the next few slides. But the students themselves, they were undergraduate. They saw the academic benefits. We, they, they say that... Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. And they like having some online components as part of their classes. So that the bottom line was they're saying they want better use of the t technologies that they're already using and they can be is easily integrated in the learning activities we're doing in, in um, our classes. So we're going to do a little share on Twitter using the hashtag you see it at the bottom, the IDML13. What thing are you thinking about as I went through these slides? Like even texting each other or doing poll any, everywhere or texting one another, some, some note date, some significant learning like an exit ticket that they learned in class. So I'm going to go to Twitter and put an idea of what are you thinking about or what have you done that students are already using their devices, so what can you do to enhance your, your learning environment or recommend to your colleagues in terms of Again, what students are already using for their own devices. So I have Twitter up to share that since it's our back channel. Oh, that's cool. So what learning activity can you do to take advantage of what students are already doing, of what young people are are already doing. That's cool, Sasha. Yeah, there's a lot of ways. See, it doesn't just necessarily have to be texting. The, I had my students doing a lot of um, photo taking and video taking because that's not um, smartphone dependent. Actually, Carrie, I have some resources at the end to show how to do some micro, doing some blogging on mobile devices. That's nice, Vicki. Ask them a question. Yeah, I've done Wafiti. It's gotten a little, they made some changes, Whitney, that it's not working for me as well. I like Selly. Oh, that's fun. The Vine videos. Good suggestions. Hi, Sherry. Good to see you. QR codes are great. Scavenger hunt. We were talking about that yesterday in a, at a presentation. Good ideas. Yeah, I actually set up, I won't talk about it here, Beth, but that same undergraduate class, we had a Facebook page for their, for instead of a discussion board, and they loved it. You know, they were the right demographic, 18 to 22-year-olds who, again, they weren't high academic, but they loved Facebook, and boy, did we get a lot more interaction than if we used a discussion board. 
Yeah, the biology wilderness tours. We talked a lot about that. I actually have a post on using, um, it was a more recent post. I could put that in for you on using, um, here. I'll put it in. On using outdoors, right? Outdoor apps. What's really nice is you could go to these websites and um, you could become like citizen scientists. There's like, so you could have students becoming citizen top 10 top apps for taking technology outdoors. And some of them they could do, they could access via the internet. They don't need an app. Some of that includes just taking notes or images. So for biology, it's really nice. So I'll put that in the Twitter for you. How, Donna? How would this be good for community health? <clears throat> yeah, the citizen scientist is really nice. It's that going back to that authentic, relevant learning that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, that's nice, Melissa. I think that's similar to my pottery teacher wanting us to take images of um, architecture and upload them to the Flickr page. See, the nice thing about doing this on Twitter is you'll have all these ideas you can aggregate later. I'll actually do a Storyfy of the ideas and post them after the presentation. All right. On my way back to the. <coughs> All right, so we're going to do a couple more sharing. I really like that you had some really good ideas. So, what we need to do is not just say, put old, old ways of doing things on new devices. So these two reports, and I encourage you to look at them later, that now we're in this opportune moment for new ways of teaching and learning. Because now we, at, I say a lot, we're no longer, educators are no longer the gatekeepers of information. That all this information is online available for free. And that it, we have ways to have the, them accessing the information them collaborating, and then becoming strengthening lear learner engagement. Going back to all those characteristics of epic wins. And this is from the ECHOR report. And if you take anything from this session today, please think deeply about this. This is the only one I'm going to read for, for, for you because it's so powerful. Again, this is student, undergraduate student recommended from their recommendations. Use technologies in more transformative ways such as participatory and collaborative interactions and for high level teaching and learning that is engaging and relevant to students' lives and future plans. Use technology more to, ex to extend learning beyond the classroom. So where that's led me to is thinking about what the topic of today is, all that was <laughs> the introduction is, what is good pedagogy for mobile learning? We used to have this idea of, um, Web 1.0, now we're calling it School 1.0. It's the age of authority where we see reading receipts responding, just like Web 1 was information dissemination, and that's a lot of our schooling. We then moved to Web 2.0, which is more engagement, just like you're engaging. As, as we got on Twitter just a few minutes ago, and we were able to have some interaction, not just you with me, but you with each other, which is so exciting. I mean, I'm doing much more talking than I'd, I'd ever do to a, in a face-to-face -face class. But, you know, I'm getting you the information and hopefully, hopefully you'll use some of the things I'm showing you. And now we're actually going to a Web 3.0 where the teacher is not even, teacher is way in the background and the learners are facilitating their own experiences with the teacher really just being a coach on the side from, from the beginning. And that's a, that's a, admirable goal. I'm going to share with you in a minute how I've gotten to Education 2.0, but really would love to get into to Education 3.0. So here's a little chart. 
about, and I really love this, what, what some of the characteristics is in terms of technology and teaching and teacher and the hardware. So I'm going to wa have you watch about four minutes of a video. It's kids doing outdoor activities with mobile devices. And if you don't have the link, I'll just go grab it for you and put it in Twitter. And um, what I want you to do in, in Twitter at the, after, or as or after you watch the video is what do you see, and I'll leave this chart up, what do you see the students doing and the teachers doing that are either education 1.0, 2.0, or 3.0, and you might see different, at different points of the learning um, parts of any one of these. So it doesn't necessarily have to be that clear. But again, I'm going to show you a video. You're going to watch a video and tell me, in terms of their mobile learning, what type of education, one, two, or three. Technology really has changed the way we we learn, and, uh, and kids are really accepting of this. If you can think it, you can do it in regards to your learning now, and I, th I think the kids understand that, and, and they enjoy that more. A lot of the projects that uh, that are designed here are designed with the environmental focus, you know, and if you're going to do that, we're better to do that than outdoors. The reality of the world is that kids are very, very into technology and a lot of the kids that I work with are more comfortable um, with digital devices than they are with, uh, with, with nature. But having those devices be part of their learning experience you know, can be a way of, of pulling them in and, uh, and applying their existing knowledge to, to a new thing. Over the past couple of years I've been incorporating more technology in my classroom. And what it has enabled me to do is to bridge my classroom teaching, the textbook types of skills and concepts that my students are learning with what is actually out in the real world. And they get the connections between what is taught in the books and what is real life. You really have to get kids doing something, collecting things, analyzing things, writing about these things, and then applying and doing something so that it's shared with someone else. The kids are outfitted today with digital cameras and tablets. Part of what we do is to gather data about the property. Kids are taking photographs of species they find. Kids are also helping to document ecological condition in each of these natural community types that they're studying. Well, I've been uploading some pictures onto Project Noah. You can post whatever you really want to, like animals and um, organisms. I write what it looks like and where I found it. I'm hoping that someone actually post something about it, like the scientific name on We have our own school mission on the site, so then they get to put their information all together in a collaborative unit, and people from around the world, including scientists, can go to our site and see what types of animals and plants live on our island. This data is not just going into a file someplace, I'm actually using it. This class, for example, has been measuring erosion along the shoreline at this preserve since 2007, so we're actually taking their information and, and acting on it, uh, which, is, which is really uh, a wonderful thing because they get to see um, the, the benefit and the, and the community benefit of their hard work. By incorporating the technology and taking my kids out into the field, they're so much more engaged. They don't see the writing and the revision and the, the editing and drafting as a chore when they know that there's a real purpose. And there's some really unique and pretty complex things that kids are doing in the classroom or out of the classroom. And sharing those with uh, other students is important, but sharing with parents so they know what's going on uh, and also sharing them with the community. That's what we're about. We're not about policies, we're not about just handbooks, we're about learning. Most of what I do as an environmental educator is, is mostly about inspiration. It's the information is secondary, but if I can help kids be excited about being outdoors, have positive experiences outdoors, especially when they're young. It, it turns technology from a distraction and from something that's 
pulling them away from what's important in life into something that's directing them towards uh, and helping them learn about the things that are really important in life. So we try to instill that idea of, of stewardship and once once you get to know something and love something, you, you have a responsibility to, to give back to it. And the quality of work that I see from students has increased because they feel it has a purpose and a reason and it's not just me looking at it. They understand they have a broader audience and they want to take pride in what they're doing. What I see in the end is much better than what I did when everything was just paper and pencil. Learning is not just within the walls of the school. The school's role is to help students develop an understanding and appreciation of the natural world, but also to make sure that they had a strong ethic regarding environmental sustainability and stewardship. It's not about just preparing them to, you know, graduate from high school, it's preparing them for, for the world, you know, and to enjoy the world, to appreciate the world. So, I mean, when they leave, we want them to be stewards of the world. All right, so again, because of time, a few of you put ideas down, but I'd love for you to visit this Padlet. Well, actually, I'll visit it just for a second. So if you, what's really nice about Padlet, again, I wanted to show you some tools, and I wanted to know what ideas you have for your own Education 2.0 or 3.0. I saw a few ideas earlier that were... Education 2.0, but I also saw, saw some 1.0s. So what you could do, what's really nice about this tool, is you, you're the only one that needs to have an account again, and all you need to do, and I tweeted out the, the Padlet URL, all you need to do is click anywhere on it, put your name in the post, and you could put a, upload a photo, a video, write something. So I'll put this Padlet's URL. And as the instructor, I can move things. I mean, as the owner of the site, the, I can move things around. So I don't care where students put them. But if you have any ideas as we continue of what Education 2.0 could look like in your setting, you could put it down. Somebody, uh, Leslie, put Digital Learning Day. Hi, Rebecca. Rebecca's popping in there. So what could be a learning activity? Yeah, this is a good tool. So this is actually a tool you could use. I like to show you sometimes we don't get, um, sometimes, sometimes students don't want to be on Twitter or we don't want to have it public. So we could actually give them, just like I'm giving this, you this. And it'll work on an iPad. Again, they'd have to have, yep, they'd have to have um, a computer. But a lot of my students, even though they had mobile devices, a lot of them had their own laptops and we had computers at school and then they, we could share. And if I had a lot more time, I'd tell you how I had students pair up so that if one didn't have a device that day, they would share and do activities together. There's workarounds if you don't, if not all students have devices. Yeah, it's a good tool. All right, so I think other than Twitter, I'm done with, so I'm going to close that for now. And you'll be able to go back to that link and look at it as well as the Twitter chat. So let's look at it. Let's go on to, and for the last 20 minutes, and I'm going to just go, kind of go 240 here. This idea of changing from a, and I'm going to show you several angles that I found congruent. The e-learning the e to the n-learning to the u-learning. You could again compare it to Education 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. This was a cool little um, visual I found the other day in terms of 1.0, standardized people, conformities matters, Education 2.0, uh, quiet, quiet revolution via conversation, and Education 3.0, where self-directed people, where whimsy matters. That's such a nice way to look at it. So this is where I wanted to lead, especially those of you, I know many of you teach adult learners. But this idea from pedagogy to andragogy to heterogogy, and heterogogy was just introduced to me about last year with a, because of a course I was teaching. And, it, and to, it, 
Uh, traditionally, pedagogy had to do with teaching kids and andragogy with adults, and heterogogy was just thrown on top of it. But if you look at the principles of each and forget about pedagogy teaching children, but pedagogy, the art of teaching, but I think we need to go beyond and differentiate between this uh, and look at it on a continuum of learning. And it depends on what you want to teach. And that's a real important thing to know. What you want to teach should determine the teaching philosophy that drives us. So even though I'm, I believe in a lot of heterogogy, knowing that there's some content, it's Padlet. The, the, um, the, it was Padlet, and you'll find it on the slides, the, the uh, bulletin board tool, P-A-D-L-E-T. And it's free accounts, and it's very cool. It used to be called Wallwisher. Another way to look at this, this continuum from pedagogy to, to heterogogy is instructivism, constructivism, connectivism. And those of you who are staying current with kind of MOOCs and George Seaman's work will understand this. But I found a congruence in it. So for me, I'm saying I'm tr showing you kind of the same, not kind of, I am showing you the same continuum, but using some some terminology that's from different areas of um, this century. I don't know how else to say it. So instructivism, it's exactly what it says. The instructor says why and how they learn about a topic. It fits with pedagogy in its strictest sense. If you look at not at the art of learning, but the art of the instructor to, at, from that chart, the instructor being the knowledge base, the information disseminator, and other images to look at the instructor, again, disseminating information as pedagogy. And there are several mobile, tool, mobile apps. I call, them, I call them apps on steroids, worksheets on steroids. There's a lot of apps out there to teach concepts. Math, there's math drills. There's the US Constitution. There are a lot of them are flashcard games another flashcard game, and they could be more interactive like frog dissemination. But if the, the total goal is to, to have students learn a content base, so instead of the teacher being the instructional source, the app itself becomes the instructional source. So that you have at the end of this a knowledge base in order to take a test. For if you look at a lot of these math drills, they're to learn knowledge often to be to do well on a test and I always ask people when they're throwing these apps out at me I do believe they have a purpose I don't use them that often but would learners choose to engage with the app on their own time so is it something that if you're asking your learners to learn through apps would it be something that excited them would they choose to use that app if if you weren't they weren't told to use it by you the instructor which is a pedagogical approach then we get into andragogy, where the instructor still becomes, is still the instructor, but becomes more of a facilitator of learning. It becomes more of a constructivist, so that you're allowing your learners then this to really come up with their own conclusions, construct their own knowledge. I really love this idea of here's what we're learning, what's your understanding about it? And you could get that understanding not from me because, like I said, today I'm doing more talking than I ever do, but having learners engage. We got a little bit with the Padlet and Twitter for you to engage, but my preference would be for you to interact more. And then you come up to, I don't know what you're going to lead today with, and, and I, don't have any, I don't have any significant idea of what you should lead today with. I hope you lead today with something but you need to be able to use it in a way that works for you. And that's a different way, I think, of learning. I wouldn't ever test you on these concepts. I might say, if I was going to test you, quote, I, on what we're covering today, I would say, what stood out for you and how might you use it in the rest of your life? Not say, define constructivism, define pedagogy. I, that, I don't think that's important. I want to know what, how you view it and how you'll use it. So I know many of us are teaching adults, and I, I looked at the seven laws of adult learning, which is andragogy. And so these are it. 
and you can look at these later. These were activities I've done with my college students and you'll see the concept active learning but later when you're able to access the slides on SlideShare you'll see that this was a communications building activity so what I have for you are links to the activity descriptions, um, how they work, some images and procedures on if you want to do them in your own classroom with your own learners. Drawing on previous experience, this was uh, they had to do cell phone interviews of one another about concepts we were covering in the class. Individual differences, again asking people to upload, this was uh, values onto the Flickr page, honoring who they are and you really see their identity in these pictures. Is it relevant to the rest of their life? This was a game on socioeconomics and equity, really powerful. I, I encourage you to have a look on this. This is one of the most powerful activities. Students told me they hated it because it brought up a lot of conflict, but it might, might, was one of the most powerful experiences they had in class. Self-direction, giving students opportunity to choose what direction they can go in. Expectations, hearing how people are we meeting their needs? And I do a lot of reflections. I use voice thread with reflections, and that goes back to the thinking and reflecting piece. And practice and feedback. This was a great activity. They were practicing how to do interviews, and other, pe other students in the class were actually giving them feedback on Sally. That's Jacob sitting there, and you can see Jacob too much leaning forward. Jacob, good good attending skills, Jacob asked for clarity. So what they did was actually give each other feedback while they were typing this feedback in while the interview was going on and then I would put it up on the whiteboard and we would review the feedback after the interviews. Really powerful. Talk about meeting a lot of the epic learning. And this was the end of, so you can look at it later, uh, this was my, this was the end of course surveys over several semesters and you can see the comments students had. So for me a lot of the activities we we did met a, a andragogical or a, or a con connectivism, a constructivism type of education 2.0. I'm hoping you're seeing a connection with all those. And this was an article I, I look, that I encourage you, I just put it in for later, how to design um, mobile learning activities to meet the characteristics of adult learners. Again, andragogy in its purest sense. This is if you're working, if you know um, Tony Vincent's work. I find that project-based learning can fit a lot of the characteristics of Education 2.0 and andragogy, so you can find some resources there about project-based learning and mobile learning, as well as there. And the final piece is heterogogy. And that's how, um, that's how really letting learners, if like this, like this MOOC you're in, it's not a MOOC, like this course you're in, this mobile learning, you're decide, you're getting some assignments, but you're just, you're deciding what you want to get out of it, how you want to interact, how much you want to contribute, how much you want to participate. And that's exactly what you're doing as part of this course. So the next few slides I'm not going to read to you, I just wanted you to have them for later. It, they really discuss how learning in the 21st century, given all this information is free, it's abundant, we can connect to anybody we want, experts are at our fingertips, and how can we actually build that into the learning experiences? How to attract people to dip into the rapidly growing flow of learning resources in order to create a more opportunities for a better life. That's the world that we're in. So education should be reflecting that. I think sometimes people learn more outside their educational institutions than they're learning inside, and that makes me sad. And our goal should always be developing um, self-regulated and autonomous learners. Developing capacity for learning and mindsets needed to be successful learners is a central attribute. It's pretty cool stuff. And I love this one. Again, I'm not, I just gave you a lot of resources, not to, not to go over all of it now, but hopefully you'll dive into it later. How heterogogy and neuroscience fits together, really cool stuff. And that fits into connectivism, if you're familiar with George Siemens' work. So basically, the instructor relinquishes ownership of the learning path and process to the learner. So, 
what I'm going to have you do is think about what, what would you like to learn right now? Mobile learning, what's something in life that interests you? And I want you to think about it in terms of a learner so you could think in terms of how you might instruct your learners. How would you use your mobile devices to do so? If we were developing a course together on this, I would then act, have you share those with me? Maybe make some recommendations, maybe give you some resources, put, put up a forum where you could connect to others. And I'm actually going to go to Twitter in a minute to have you think about that. But then I would also ask you that how would you document your learning? And there's lots of ways. And then giving you an option based on your needs. You could blog about it. I do recommend blogging. And there's a lot of ways to blog using mobile devices. You could do photo essays about, about what you're learning on your self-directed learning journey. And there's a lot of photo sharing sites so that actually students could do it in groups and work collaboratively if they have topics come together. And then video essays. And there's a lot of ways you could, um, I had my students, I did a YouTube and again, I got a, like I did with Flickr, you get a dummy, a dummy email and students could send their videos right from their phones to, you, to your YouTube channel. So I want to, and then we'll go to Twitter, what is the big overriding lesson, legacy you want to leave with your learners? This, this was the group of students. What do you want them to leave with? Do you want them to, do you want them to, I, I talk to elementary students, teachers, and say, do you want to be known to have the best worksheets ever, or do you want them to leave with something more powerful? So I want to go back and then go to Twitter. What do you want to learn, and how could you use your learning, your mobile devices to do so? So I'm going to go to the Twitter stream, and that's how we're going to end today, and having you discuss some of those ideas, and then I'll look through Twitter to see if there's anything else you want to um, explore. So again, the question is, and think outside the box so that, again, I want you to come from a learner perspective so that you could think, think how you might incorporate this with your students but then get ideas from other. Chris, I believe it does. So if you look at those charts, Chris asks, if does heterogogy correlate with Web 3.0? I see a connection Web 3.0, the idea of, and School 3.0 of really having everything connected, having things in the cloud, um, being able to, to, to figure out what you want to learn and then find your own resources and people to help you. Or any questions or, or thoughts you have? So the two questions, I'm going to add one is, what do you want to learn? And how would you use your mobile devices to do so? And then the other one, because there's only a few minutes left, I want to ask is, what stood out from you? What stood out? What was your significant learning? And what would you, what do you plan to do, think or do differently? Remember, that's what I said in the beginning. If you're not going to be, be um, thinking or doing something different because of today, then I failed you. It could be with mobile learning. It doesn't have to be. As well as opening it up to any final thoughts or questions. That's a great idea. And Smith, that's a great idea. So Sylvia, how can you get your adult learners to take it outside of class? And it doesn't necessarily just have to be Sylvia that answer. Sylvia is saying they still believe that learning occurs in class. How can you take this idea of mobile learning outside of class and get your students to start thinking about it? Yeah, Twitter's pretty cool. That's nice, Vicky.
Again, any ideas how you might use what you heard or think or want to do more research on? So I'm a potter. I do pottery. That's what I was doing this morning on the side to get out of my, because I'm so much into ed tech all the time. I'm always learning about it by somebody will bring up a potter and I'll go, I'll Google them on my cell phone. I take pictures of art. I watch videos on my cell phone. There's just a lot of, I use my cell phone a lot for learning about this. So AT, would, does, it, does that mean they would take pictures and videos themselves? Yeah, Daryl, I know. That's what Daryl's asking me to put the last slide up. I think I closed it. That's no problem. Well, she goes looking for that if she has it still open. If you love today, and Lord knows it was amazing watching the interaction. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. <laughs> I'm the host. And uh, Jackie's on fire. It's incredible. Here's the recap. We're going to send out. Uh, in a couple of days, a link to an on-demand playback of this webinar, because this is like drinking from a fire hose today. We're going to send out a link to the slides. We're going to send out a link to the entire Twitter conversation that took place. And if you like that, there's still one more webinar in this IDL, IDML 13 series that's taking place May 9th. So please watch your inbox to get that invite. And you get to do this all over again then. Jackie, you've been incredible. The, the audience has really embraced you. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge today. Um, again, she's going to continue to monitor Twitter, as will we. So the conversation will now end here today now, but carry on there. Jackie, once again, I just want to say thank you for just imparting your knowledge upon us today. Thanks. I had a great time. And again, you please feel free to contact me on Twitter. You, you found um, I blog about what happens in my classes, and I hope you do too. The world, oh, the world needs to know these really cool things you're doing and thinking about. And as I tell other educators, what's the worst thing that can happen? You try something out. I've had a few bombs. I had one I thought was great, and the students just looked at me, and I went, okay, let's just move on to the next thing. But what? But the success, look at that student survey, the success, they just loved it, and so did I. I was excited about using it and couldn't believe how cool the device is, using the devices. I used them, and we met three hours a week for 12 weeks, and we used them every single time, and it was exciting. So... Let us know. Tweet about things you're doing it for your own classrooms. And with that, we're going to wrap it up. Th thanks again, Jackie. Thank you, everybody. See you May 9th. Continue the conversation now. Hash IDML13. Have a great day, folks. Take care.